Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, I'll tell you that again. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Hope your weekend was great. Um, yesterday was kind of not fun outside, so finishing my room, which is exciting. Um, so I just wanted to... Um, <laughs> to um, begin reading. We left off with chapter three on page 60 is where I was reading from. Hi, how are you? I see one person. Oh, seven people are watching. Very exciting. Much better than on Saturday. I guess everyone was taking a break Saturday. Oh boy, we've got all kinds of people. Ella and Noah. Am I right? And <laughs> all right, so you guys were in here, but I said good afternoon, everybody. So I was waiting for a response. I can think I think I can hear you. Hi, Lucas. Glad you're here. All right, so I'm going to read. I'm gonna begin reading. We left off with <laughs> I knew I was right. I'm getting old, but Noah, thanks. Okay, so we left off with the fact that um, uh, the Jewish people were no longer allowed to go to school. And if you were here or if you watched my other video, we talked a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to read that paragraph again because I think it is true for us right now a little bit. Not that we're here, but we are being forced to stay home away from school. So at the beginning of December 1939, the Nazis decreed Jews could no longer attend school. When I first heard of this new restriction, I felt a brief sense of freedom. What 10-year-old wouldn't enjoy a few days off from school, right? But the feeling didn't last long. I quickly realized the vast difference between choosing not to go to school um, for a day or two and being forbidden to ever attend. I was just one, it was just one more way the Nazis sought to take everything of value away from us. And yes, they said value. Education is valuable. I now joined David and Patia in looking for jobs. It wasn't easy since there were a lots of other Jewish kids doing exactly the same thing. David managed to find work as a plumber's helper, carrying his tools and assisting him in a number of ways. My sister worked cleaning houses. I started hanging out at a soft drink company, volunteering to put labels on the bottles. Listen to this, guys. See if you would do this. At the end of the day, I received a single bottle of soda as payment. I took it home for all of us to share. Hi, Marin. Glad to see you here. Um, one afternoon as I was work returning from work, I spotted one of the Gestapo who had beaten my father. I was sure of it. I don't know what possessed me, but I chased after him and begged him to tell me where he had taken my father. The intimidating figure stared down at me with disdain, as if I were less than a piece of lint on his coat. Had I known better, I would have been scared for my life, but I didn't, and maybe my boldness impressed him, because he told me my father was at St. Michael's prison. I raced to find David, and together we sprinted into the central city to the forbidden building. Sure enough, the authorities confirmed that our father was there. Though we weren't permitted to see him, just knowing he was alive gave us a renewed sense of purpose. Somehow he had held on, and so could we. David and I spent most of our days going to the prison, taking with us packages of food carefully prepared and wrapped by my mother. As I think about it now, I realize the Gestapo officer could have lied to me, and I would have not have known, but for some reason he didn't. Several weeks later, for no apparent reason, my father was released from prison. Yay! <laughs> the moment he came through our door was one of overwhelming relief and joy. At the same time, it brought an unexpected sadness. Yes. Yes, mother. I'm reading and my kids are watching me. Hi, kids. I don't know why you can't get it. <laughs> okay, bye, mom. <laughs> See how they are. I knew she was probably trying to watch, so I was wondering why she was calling me. She said she can't find it. I don't know. Anyway, back to our book. Um, <laughs> where was I? Um, oh, yes. 
his dad came home. So that's exciting, but it also brought some sadness. Um, it was easy to see that he had gone, what he had gone through had changed him. It wasn't just that he was weak and gaunt. He was changed in a more fundamental way. The Nazis had not only stripped him of his strength, although he would find a great reserve of it in the years ahead, but also of the confidence and self-esteem that had put a spring in his step. Now he spoke little and walked with downcast eyes. He had lost his job at the glass factory and he had lost something even more precious, his dignity as a human being. It shook me to the core to see my father defeated. If he couldn't stand up to the Nazis, how could I? As 1939 drew to an end, I realized that my father's prediction had been wrong. Our situation seemed dire in every way. All signs pointed to the war going on for a long time. The Nazis were not content with what had already inflicted what they had already inflicted on us Jews. Each day brought a new humiliation. Hi, mom. I see you're now here. Good job. Good work. <laughs> if a German soldier approached, Jews had to get off the sidewalk until he passed by. Beginning in late November, Jews who were 12 years old and 12 years and older were required to wear a white armband with a blue star of David that we had to purchase from the Jewish council, the governing body the Nazis had appointed to deal with all Jewish matters. To be caught without the armband meant arrest and most likely torture and death. Since I was not yet 12, I didn't wear the armband identification. When I was old enough to wear it, I made up my mind not to. Even though my confidence had been shaken but it, but what, mm, by what I had seen and experienced, there were times when I disobeyed the rules and thumbed my nose at the Nazis. In a way, I used the, their own stereotypes against them, since there was nothing about me that made it obvious I was a Jew. With my thick, dark hair and blue eyes, I looked like a lot of other Polish boys. Now and then I would sit on the park bench just to prove I could do what I wanted, resisting the Nazis in my own small way. Of course, I couldn't do that when anyone who knew me was around. The friends with whom I used to play now looked the other way when I was near. I don't know if they would be, have betrayed me, but most likely they would have, in an attempt to obliterate their memory of how we had once been, they had once been friends with a Jew. I watched them walk to school in the mornings as if nothing had changed, when for me, everything had. Oh, that would be so sad. I was no longer the happy-go-lucky, adventurous boy who had gleefully looked forward to snatching a free ride on the street cart. Somehow, I became an obstruction to Germany's goal of world supremacy. My father found his own way to defy the Nazis and to help us survive at the same time, even though it meant doing something illegal. wonder what it is. He worked on the sly, off the books, so to speak, for the glass company on Lippawa Street. One day, he was sent across the street to Lippawa Street 4, to the enamelware factory where he sometimes had repaired tools and equipment before the war. The new owner, a Nazi, needed a safe opened. My father asked no questions. He simply pulled out the correct tools and quickly cracked open the safe. It turned out to be the best thing he ever did, quite since quite unexpectedly, the Nazi offered him a job. I have often wondered what my father thought at that moment. Did he feel relief or only a different anxiety about what this Nazi would ask him to do next? He knew that whatever wages he earned would never reach his hand, but would go straight to the Nazi. In other words, accepting the offer of a job meant working for free. But it also meant the chance of protection for himself and his family. There might be someone to stand between him and the next Nazis to come to his door. It was worth a try. Refusing really wasn't an option. Maybe he sensed that there was something decent about this particular Nazi. Maybe, beaten down as he already was and ready to grab on the next thinnest lifeline of hope, he just thought, do as you're told, don't make trouble, show your value, survive. Whatever his motivation, my father accepted the job on the spot. In doing so, he made a decision that had unimaginable consequences. The Nazi businessman for whom safe he cracked, who had just hired him, was Oskar Schindler. Now, we haven't really talked much, I don't think, about Oskar Schindler. I think a little bit at the beginning I did, we read about how he was going back to meet him. 
Um, usually I do a little bit more um, in the classroom and we kind of learn a little bit more about him uh, before we read the book. So that being said, I'm just going to begin chapter four. I'm only going to read a few pages in chapter four. So let's see what happens. So he just got hired by Oscar Schindler. And as we know, Oscar Schindler is the one who ended up saving Leon's life because Leon at the beginning of the book was going back um, to thank him and to say hi to him. So let's see what happens. Chapter four, Oscar Schindler has been called many names, scoundrel, war profiteer, drunk. When Schindler gave my father a job, I didn't know any of those names and I wouldn't have cared if I had. Krakow was filled with Germans who wanted to make a profit from the war. Schindler's name meant something to me only because my, he hired my father. That fortunate encounter over the safe resulted in my father becoming one of the first Jewish workers at the company Schindler initially leased and then in November 1939 took over from a bankrupt Jewish businessman named Abram Bankier. In fact, of the 250 workers Schindler hired in 1940, only seven were Jews. The rest were Polish Gentiles. Schindler renamed the company German Enamelware Works, a name designed to appeal to German army contractors. He called it Emalia for short. Armies need a lot more than weapons and bullets to fight a war. As a clever businessman, Schindler seized the opportunity and began producing enamelware pots and pans for Germans, a line of production guaranteed to generate a large ongoing profit, especially since his labor costs were minimal. He could exploit Polish workers at low wages and Jews for none at all. Although my father didn't bring home any money, he was able to bring home some pieces of bread or coal in his pockets. More importantly, his job gave us something else, something that I valued more even when I was hungry, and it was hard to think about anything other than the gnawing in my stomach. Working for Schindler meant that my father was officially employed. It meant that when he was stopped on the street by German soldier or policeman who wanted to grab him for forced labor to sweep the street or haul garbage or chop ice in winter, he had the necessary credential as protection. It was called a Bescheinigung, a, a document stating that my father was officially employed by a German company. It was a shield of protection and status. It didn't make him invincible to the whims of the Nazi occupiers, but it made him a lot less vulnerable than he had been when he was unemployed. I don't know how much he knew about what my father did each day, but Schindler certainly realized he was a skilled, resourceful worker. His safe-cracking prowess had earned him Schindler's respect. He kept on earning that respect day after day. Schindler knew little about the nuts and bolts of manufacturing and wasn't interested in learning. He had em employees to do that. My father worked long hours at Emalia and then put in second shifts at his old glass factory. Both were sources of small amounts of food. He also made arrangements with his Gentile friend, Wojek, to sell. Are you ready? Some of you guessed this before, but maybe not. He also made arrangements with his Gentile friend, Wojek, to sell a few of his fine suits on the black market. Wojek kept some of the money as payment for his efforts but what remained was enough to provide us with a bit more to eat. So some of you were with me at the very beginning of the book and we talked about, and I talked about how his dad's suits would later um, help them. So his dad right now just sold some of his suits so that they were able to buy food so that they were able to actually eat and not starve to death. So that is the first way that the suits are going to help them. So those of you that said that, I'm not sure if you said that, were correct. Okay. Meanwhile, in Krakow, the Germans tightened their grip on us. Jewish parents could no longer reassure children with the phrase, it will soon be over. And a new phrase surfaced, if this is the worst that happens. My mother and father also adopted this saying as a tool of survival, perhaps as a way of keeping darker thoughts at bay. When forced to hand over our radio to the Nazis, we silently repeated the words whenever a German was near, we whispered to ourselves, if this is the worst that happens. So if you think about that, um, kind of a good saying, like if this is the worst that happens, I'm still here. 
Hi, Nate. Um, I'm still here. And, you know, if this is the worst that happens, okay, we can do this, right, guys? So we got this. If the worst that happens is we don't get to go back to school, I'll be very sad. But I'll still be here. And hopefully we'll see each other again. In the first months of 1940, I could still walk the streets of Krakow in relative freedom, even no longer fearlessly. I could pass as a Gentile because I was still young enough not to have to wear the identifying Star of David. Every day I watched the German soldiers in their field gray uniforms who guarded a petroleum tank across the street from our apartment. I couldn't help but be intrigued by them and by the well-polished rifles they carried. After all, I was an inquisitive kid. I know. Many of you are like that out there. <laughs> inquisitive, curious. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it gets you into trouble because you're so inquisitive, but it's good to be inquisitive too. That's how you learn things. The soldiers, really not much older than I, were cordial, even friendly. Since I spoke German, I probably seemed pretty harmless to them. Having the occasional chat with me helped break the monotony of their days. They even let me inside the guard station for a few times and shared a piece of chocolate from their rations. That is not heard of a German soldier sharing with a Jewish boy. However, German soldiers could change in an instant from cordial to brutal. If they were bored or had had too much to drink, they might single out a traditionally dressed Jew for a beating. Powerless to stop the abuse, I felt ashamed and confused whenever I witnessed such incidents. Why did the Nazis hate us so much? I had known many men, my grandfathers included, who were traditionally dressed Jews. There was nothing demonic or unclean about them. No reason for them to be subjected to such violence. But the message on Nazi propaganda posters plastered all over the city told a different story. With their distorted, lice-infested figures and captions of hate, they made it seem permissible, even proper, to attack a Jew even if he differed from the poster portrayal. Yeah, so a way to get the people to not like Jewish people, um, the Nazis put out flyers and um, saying how bad the Jewish people were and how gross and dirty and they have lice. And so that kind of made it almost okay for the Nazis to to just choose anybody individually and and hurt them. Not cool. Then one night I experienced the soldier's wrath. Oh, hi, Nate. Didn't I say hi, Nate? I thought I did. Hi, Nate. My bad. There you go. Good. Thumbs up. Okay. Then one night I experienced the soldier's wrath firsthand. Someone tipped them off that I, the very same boy who joked with them in German and to whom they've treated like a younger brother and allowed to hang out in their guard booth, was a Jew. As I was sleeping, they shoved their way into our apartment and grabbed me out of my bed by my hair. What's your name? They shouted. Are you a Jew? I replied that I was. They slapped me, furious that they had assumed I was a normal kid. You're welcome. Um, fortunately, they didn't take the abuse beyond their slaps and abruptly left our apartment. I ran into my mother's arms, shaking and crying. And this time I was the one who thought, if this is the worst that happens. So that ends chapter, well, not chapter four, but um, that ends like that section that I'm going to read. Um, so yeah, so now things are getting kind of heated up in, in his city. Um, they are making restrictions on them. Um, Do anyone have any questions or comments about the book first? Um, I'll wait for you guys. Marin, I know it's definitely sad. And Lucas, I know it's really scary. And it would be really scary to be a Jewish person who you never did anything wrong. And all of a sudden you're targeted for just being who you were born to be. It's kind of sad. Hi, Hank. Okay, Noah, you don't have any comments, questions. Okay. Anyone have any other things you want to say? School appropriate, even though we're not in school. School. My mom's watching and listening, so behave. Um, anything you guys want to say to me um, or questions you have for me? I tried to use um, Seesaw today, and for some reason, it was not letting me log into Seesaw. So I'm going to try to get into Seesaw after I'm done here. Um, thanks, Noah. I will have a good day. 
I had to finish painting my room. I started it the other yesterday. I know I was going to start the other day, but then I didn't got too late, but um, I'm going to finish painting my bedroom today and go outside for a walk. So hopefully you guys um, get outside and do some exercise, move around. Tell Laura and I said hi. Um, so yeah, so I miss you guys so much. I wish that I could see you guys. I love when I see your comments on the side because that means that you're there, even though I can't see you. Um, and I hope everything's going well. I hope everyone is well in your family. Um, oh, good. You did a walk today already? Ugh, I have not gotten out yet, so I am going to go out. It looks kind of cold outside, but we'll see. Just bundle up. So, oh, you ran a mile. Nice. Good work. I can hardly run anymore. My legs have been, I've been having problems with my legs with running. So I can't really. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. I, I didn't really want to say anything, even though I'm the ELA teacher, but yeah, I ran a mile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is mega freezing. Who's turtle guy? I don't remember. Who's turtle guy? Hi, Maddie. Nice to see you here. My legs are excessive. I know. Well, I've got this, I don't know. I have this issue. There's a a muscle in the on the back of my leg that every time I run, it kind of gets irritated and I can't hardly walk. And I can barely walk when I'm done. Oh, hi, Gage. I didn't say your name because I saw Turtle Guy. And sorry if you told me the other day, but you know, I'm getting old. I forget these things. So yay, I'm so happy to see all of you. Makes me so happy. Um I guess I could take off my glasses since I'm not reading, but it really does make it hard for me to read the screen. But my mom is scared of a chicken. She, listen, Brooke got chased by one of our roosters one time. Those things are scary. They can hurt you. Um, yeah, you're on your home account. I figured ah, my hair's all crazy, but I did shower today. So that's good, right? Showering's good. Exercising's good. Um, anything else you guys have planned for the day? I would, Type it in there. Anything exciting? <laughs> Maren's like a chicken. I'm telling you, chickens are scary, I tell you. Actually, they're great. I love them. They lay eggs. The rooster is the one that was scary. So, yeah, just eat it, right, right Maren? Just eat it. Why not? I don't know. Anyway, anything else anyone has to say? Because I am going to head out. I am soaking an egg in vinegar. Ooh, doing some science. Is that what the deal is? Because it doesn't it take away the um, shell? I think that's what it does. My backyard is flooded. So I, oh man, that stinks. I'm so sorry. Ugh. Um, yeah, for two, so has it anything changed in it? I'm wondering, probably, because I think it takes a shell off and then leaves that thin lining, I believe is what happens. I can't remember. I used to do a long time ago when I taught science. Yes, I taught science, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, it makes sense. That's what I thought. So it, it takes, it um, disintegrates that outer shell, I believe. So anyway, mm -hmm. I woke up at 11 o'clock today. Woo, you slept in. I didn't go to bed till late last night. I don't know, I couldn't sleep. And then I woke up early, so I'm kind of tired. Why did I put the, I don't know why you put the, what? <laughs> I don't know, Gage. Why did you put the egg and vinegar? I don't know what you're trying to say. So, all right, peeps. I will, <laughs> I will, I'm going to head out. I love you guys. Be checking Seesaw. I'm going to try and get, um, on there later today and um, post something. So we'll see if I can get in there or not. All right. I love you guys. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Love you.